Welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Real glad that you could join us again. Going to be speaking with Dr. Linda Sezik this morning, VP of Clinical Development and Medical Affairs at Fibrogen. And she's joining us on the program to talk about some new data that was presented at the American Society of Nephrology Kidney Week 2020. Welcome to Health Professional Radio, Dr. Sezik, and thank you for taking the time. Truly my pleasure. Uh, give us a bit of your uh, background professionally, if you if you would, and um, talk about the National Kidney Foundation and your current role there at Fibrogen. Absolutely. So um, I am a nephrologist by training, and um, after fellowship, I um, did research at Duke University Medical Center for um, about 13 to 15 years. I'd have to actually do the math where I worked at the Duke Clinical Research Institute doing multi-center clinical trials um, for patients with chronic kidney disease and on dialysis. Um, after having an experience in um, the CHIRE trial, which was a trial of a potent alpha, where we um, tried to figure out the best hemoglobin target to treat anemia with, but were surprised to find a safety signal with a potent alpha um, I decided that I needed to take that to the next step, and I made a move to Fibrogen to help to develop their hip pull hydroxylase um, inhibitor compound to hopefully um, treat anemia with a better safety profile than the currently available agents. With respect to the National Kidney Foundation and the American Society of Nephrology, these are two wonderful organizations that serve the needs of um, kidney patients by um, raising awareness of kidney disease and helping to educate kidney professionals. Um, I was the first female president of the National Kidney Foundation um, about 10 years ago, wow, how time flies, and have worked with the American Society of Nephrology in a number of capacities. And I'm now at Fibrogen, where I, I play a role in medical affairs and clinical development um, for the compound that we'll be discussing, Rock to do Step. Kidney Week 2020, that's where, where this uh, information was presented on this new compound. Um, first, let's talk about the condition that this compound is uh, intended to treat. Sure. So um, this compound is a treatment for anemia. And the nice thing about it, one of, the, one of the best things about it is it's an oral compound. The currently available therapies that people think about, a potent alpha, darbopoietin, et cetera, are all either intravenous or subcutaneous administration, which often require going to a doctor's office. This is an oral compound which you write a prescription for and a healthcare provider titrates, just like they would titrate anything else um, with like a blood pressure medicine for hypertension. Um, the anemia that we are currently focused on is the anemia associated with chronic kidney disease. As the kidneys cease to work as well, um, which is a nicer way of saying, saying fail, as they cease to work as well, they don't sense the fact that the body is not getting enough oxygen. And that's the sort of complicated hypoxia-inducible factor technology, which we can get into more if um, you think that the listeners would be interested in that. But the kidneys cease to sense that the heart is being starved of oxygen, that the brain is being starved of oxygen, and they don't send out the right signal to say, hey, bone marrow, can you please make more red cells? Mm -hmm. And what our compound does is it um, tells the kidney to send that signal out so that the bone marrow can be instructed to do its job. So how prevalent is this condition? Well, chronic kidney disease is um, unfortunately um, increasing. It's increasing um, in the U.S. because of extended lifespan, thank goodness, because we are doing such a great job in treating heart attacks, and strokes, etc., and people are growing older and they're developing more comorbidities. Chronic kidney disease is um, also increasing in other countries as things like um, obesity and diabetes and hypertension begin to get into countries that previously haven't experienced it. It's currently one of the priorities for the World Health Organization in terms of non-communicable diseases and is getting increasingly recognized as something that the, the world is needing to deal with. And the reason that people are so focused on it is twofold. First of all, 
having your kidneys not work as well, i.e. fail, is not a fun way to live. It dramatically impacts quality of life and, um, you know, pushes a person more toward dialysis, which is never a fun conversation to have with a patient. But also, it increases the risk of just about everything. It increases the risk associated with diabetes. It increases the risk of going to the operating room for another procedure. It's one of those um, unhappy risk multipliers that increases the risk of everything in life. So um, it, it's important for every layer of healthcare professional to really understand and recognize in their patients so that they can properly mitigate risk. Now, this compound, you say it was roxatostat? There are a couple of ways to say it. Uh-huh. Um, some people say it roxatostat. Um, I'm, I'm a roxadustat person, okay. um, but that's, the, that's the, the generic name, yeah. Now, how does this treatment greatly improve upon traditional treatments for CKD or the anemia associated with it? Well, um, previously, the the current, um, the available standard of care is um, high doses of erythropoietin, the um, hormone that the kidneys produce to stimulate the bone marrow to make red cells. And by high doses, I mean tens of thousands of units. Um, where your normal level of erythropoietin is about 100 and it can increase to about 500 when you climb a mountain or you give blood or you have pulmonary edema. Mm-hmm. Rocks to do that, what it does, it allows the cell to experience hypoxia. So what that means is the cells in the kidney, which should um, experience hypoxia, now send out the signal that they are hypoxic and meaning having low uh, low oxygen delivery to them so that they make erythropoietin at about the level that they normally should for their degree of anemia, right around that 500 mark in a really physiologic range. So the question is, why would roxadustat work with lower erythropoietin levels, whereas simply providing erythropoietin, you need to provide thousands and thousands of units? Because roxadustat does much more than just increase erythropoietin. It's not just an oral equivalent of epoetin alpha and darbopoietin. It affects inflammation so that the body can now respond to those normal-ish levels of erythropoietin. It affects iron that the body would normally sequester in cells we call the reticular endothelial system so that that iron now can get into the, to the blood and be delivered to the bone marrow so that it can be utilized by the bone marrow. So in short, by utilizing the system that the body normally has to send hypoxia and protect cells from low oxygen levels. Um, Roxadustat really just resets the problem that chronic kidney disease um, puts in front of us in terms of the treatment of anemia without having to use um, really high levels of a replacement hormone. Now, I do understand that uh, this compound has been approved for patients in China and uh, Japan, I think. Is it available here in the United mm-hmm. States? If And if not, when do you anticipate that it will be? Fibrogen and AstraZeneca are currently working very closely with the uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Mm-hmm. And we anticipate having their final decision um, on December 20th of 2020. So um, we're all very hopeful um, and we're really looking forward to that date um, to be able to provide this drug to um, patients here in the U.S. Where online can we go for a great resource to learn more? Well, in healthcare providers, um, the best, I think the best source is always the primary data. I, you know, I'm, a, I'm an academic at heart, so I would suggest that people go to uh, PubMed and search on rocks to do steps. We have published um, six phase two studies, and we're currently in the process of publishing our phase three studies. So looking at the primary data um, is always um, the right way to go. 
Um, and I think that's probably the best way to proceed because those articles not only have the primary data, but they also have good discussions and introductions that set the medical need, the mechanism of action of the drug, and discuss the implications of a lot of the, the findings and the importance of them. And where can our listeners get some more information about Fibrogen online? Fibrogen.com is our website. And that provides um, a lovely overview of our company um, and the wonderful people that work at it. And I, I, I mean that with, um, you know, true sincerity. Um, we have a great family that is really dedicated to um, a, a lot of different um, areas where patients are really in need of novel therapy. Well, I appreciate you stopping in this morning and speaking with us, Dr. Sessick. Thank you so much. It was truly my pleasure, Neil. I hope you have a wonderful day. You do the same. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio. 